We've dreamed of full-time RV life before retirement. We figured out most everything we need to do except one thing. What if one of us gets sick, injured, or needs medical care? Today we have the answers on understanding and shopping for healthcare plans for RV living for those of us under 65. Hey everyone, we are still recovering from COVID, still in quarantine, feeling much better, um, but still some lingering things. So we've still stayed in quarantine. We don't really want to be around anyone. So welcome to our house again. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard many full-time RVers say, just go for it and everything will fall into place once you get out on the road. We don't necessarily agree with that thinking because one serious illness or injury can literally bankrupt you here in the U.S. if you don't have good coverage. High health care bills are the number one reason that people in the U.S. would consider taking money out of their retirement account early or even having to file for bankruptcy. We spent a year asking questions of full-time RVers about their health care coverage and the answers really didn't apply to our situation or really didn't address our concerns. Many are retired military who are covered with their VA benefits, which we absolutely think they deserve. A lot of people are Canadian citizens that can use their health care coverage here in the United States. A few are under 35 and not worried about it. And then there's a fair amount that are 65 who are covered by Medicare with their Medigap or Medicare Advantage policies. We've got a lot of information for you in this video. You may want to jump ahead or refer back to certain parts for review. And we put time links in the description below so you can get to the part of the video that you need. We want to start our full-time RV life right. Jamie handles property and casualty insurance and Medicare in his agency, but we turn to a health insurance expert on what's available for us. What is health insurance and most importantly, what is not health insurance but, be, but could be part of the solution? Two years ago I had the flu. Within two days I had pneumonia and was in the hospital because I couldn't get enough oxygen. I was hospitalized for nine days. My health insurance company actually advocated for me to make sure I wasn't sent home after only four days with an IV and oxygen. My health insurance company actually requested a second opinion Sometimes that can happen and I don't think people realize sometimes it works in our favor. Anyway, the full bill was well over $60,000 and I had copay, which was only $300, but coinsurance, which a lot of companies charge now, was 20% of that bill. However, again, my health insurance company, who also didn't want to pay the $60,000 bill, negotiated on my behalf and theirs, of course, but they got it so far down that my coinsurance, my 20%, was just $1,500. Wow, that was a huge lesson to us. Health insurance is not something you leave to chance. It's definitely a love-hate part of life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will not head out to nomad living without a well-chosen plan. And we also want to make sure that we have coverage in the states that we'll visit and physicians we may, we may want to see. Susan O'Kelly is a seasoned health insurance agent and she's based out of Colorado. She's the owner of Avante Insurance Services. She's also licensed in other states, but if she's not licensed in your state, she'd be more than happy to find somebody who is. She enjoys educating people about what to look out for and helping clients start to think about the information that applies to them and their situation. I certainly had several aha moments during the presentation, as you'll see from this video. No problem, thanks for having me. So let's dig right in. Um, health insurance for RVers over 60, uh, under 65. Um, over 65 is easy, but we're gonna focus today on the under 65. A lot of questions tend to burble up. How do I get coverage? So let's talk about it. I know you guys are gonna cover some of the other areas, but the high level topics are gonna be what's available out there, what coverage area, depending on where you're going, when can you enroll? We'll spend a little bit of time there. How much does it cost? Another big key area. And how about Obamacare and the ACA subsidy? Get those questions a lot. 
cost comparison. What does it mean by being off exchange versus on exchange? I got a few other ideas that we can bounce around. Um, and then last but not least, my sort of Susan's version of before you hit the road, what's available? So health insurance. Health insurance is very, very specific. It's an employer-sponsored plan. It's a group association plan, or it's going to be traditional, individual, major medical. That's it. And then there's everything else. So the everything else bucket's pretty big. There's a lot of them. Um, these co-share ministries are, are popular. And, and I'm going to spend a little time on that, too. So... So don't let me blow by it too fast. Okay. Um, hospital indemnity plans. Indemnification means that, that you are made whole again based on whatever happens. It's a principle of insurance, indemnification. In a hospital indemnity plan, there's usually a limit. And you something bad happens, you go to the doctor or the hospital and you save your receipts and you submit them to the plan for reimbursement. Um, By the way, health share plans also work that way. They are reimbursement type policies. Then we have accident and critical illness. Those are very, very specific. Uh, cancer, um, heart disease. So whatever it is that's wrong is what's covered on that specific critical illness or accident plan. And it only covers the things that are listed on that plan. Travel insurance. Uh, Jamie, I think that you have some more information on travel insurance. It's very, very popular. Right. And we're going to do a separate video on travel assist, like through Good Sam or FMCA. Or yeah. And, and those are great plans. But remember, folks, they're not insurance. Um, dental and vision plans. Those are an ancillary product that you might want to look at. Um, and then prescription drug plans. Most individual health plans and group plans and employer-sponsored plans come with some sort of prescription drug program, but you're gonna to need to find something that fits you guys. I think the key component, let's get to the next slide here, is gonna be what are your coverage areas? And that's gonna be very, very, very important. The old, good old-fashioned PPO, is going to be the best option for RVers that are under 65 because a PPO in general is going to cover you on a national policy. Now, there's some caveats that I kind of put on this screen here. Even with a PPO, if you know you're going to be out of your area uh, and or you think you have something going on, you're going to want to check. Is there coverage in somewhere else because in two months that's where you expect to be and you might need something done or something looked at? Now, the most important thing to remember about a PPO and signing up on an individual health plan that has a PPO is where is your quote unquote home state? And I know that um, South Dakota is very, very popular for being a home state. Um, so is Florida. Now, South Dakota has really favorable circumstances for your RV registration, but Florida is more favorable for you for health insurance options. So when it comes time for you guys to hit the road, you're going to need to look at that as well. Right. And that's based on, I think, that the term that gets thrown around a lot with the RV um, population is domicile. Domicile, <clears throat> so they they might be familiar with that. And that was interesting to find out that just because one's good for your vehicle registration and maybe taxes or whatever, another might be more beneficial for the health insurance. Yeah, the the three that I hear you touched on too. You touched on South Dakota, and you also touched on um, Florida. Florida, Texas is another one. Uh, ah. where people are doing that as well. And I will say, yeah, Texas is great, but their health insurance plans are, are very, very limiting. Uh, before I leave this screen, I want to I put a reminder that bo that bottom bullet says talk is talking about checking the summary of benefits because you really, really, really need to look at what are the co-pays, what is co-insurance, and what is the maximum out-of-pocket expense. Look into that. When you guys get ready to really dig in, 
pay attention to the summary of benefits. Every plan has one by law. They have to have a summary of benefits. So get, before you get too excited about getting a health insurance plan, there are some limitations on when you can enroll. So if you're currently on a health insurance plan with an employer and you decide you're going to hit the road next month, great. You have what we know is a special enrollment period, an SEP, super duper. You had coverage until the end of the month on this date and then your new plan will start here, no problem. However, if you have coverage that terminated a few months ago in the middle of the year and you didn't do anything about getting replacement coverage, you are going to be stuck waiting until open enrollment. I have a bullet point here. There is a, an, another little loophole that you can leverage, and that is if you are moving out of your service area. Okay. So let's say you terminate coverage with your employer, but you're still getting ready, and then you're ready to hit the road. We're now three months down, down the road, as it were. That would really dovetail into where you have your state of domicile, because on the, the one hand, you might have an SCP you can leverage because you're moving out of your service area. And I think um, a, another tip I heard from some other full-time RVers was they went ahead and activated the COBRA plan under their employer and then hit the road and then decided, you know, chose their domicile and then looked for insurance. Now, if you have a COBRA plan, how does that affect your at what point you could um, enroll? That is a really good question, and it, it is going to depend upon your employer. So backing up a step, uh, in 15 years ago, 10 years ago even, COBRA plans were very, very expensive. If you left your employer and you took COBRA, it was, it was yeah. you, you almost felt like you should go without insurance. It's not that way anymore. So when I talk to people like you guys and you have an opportunity to take COBRA, take COBRA. It's great. You're still getting to enjoy the benefit of your employer plan, which usually has a lower copay and a lower coinsurance and a comparable rate as to what you would pay on the open market. So always take COBRA. And then keep, look at those triggers and determine when are you going to terminate COBRA and pick up your domicile state because then that is absolutely a qualifier for moving out of state and having a valid SEP. And I guess then keeping in mind though, if I did take the COBRA and I left and then like you're saying, we didn't do anything for a couple of months, but then we hit the road. Now that COBRA plan is really identical to my previous plan. So I might not be able to get regular health care outside of my state, right? The state I was in. It depends on the plan. If your employer plan is a PPO that has national coverage and I'm coaching you to do your homework, you'll have done your homework to determine does your COBRA plan have a PPO option that you can elect to, to, to be part of and have coverage anywhere. Is it a PPO plan? So how much does it cost? And I always say it depends, and it really does. One of the things you want to look at is thinking about the cost of premium as it relates to your budget. If you spend little money on your premium, you're going to have a lot of out-of-pocket when bad things happen. But if you want to spend more on your premium, when you wind up sick, there's very little that you have to spend out-of-pocket. So you guys are going to have to decide for yourself, where does that fit in your budget? And it, it, it goes back to that summary of benefits. Pay attention to the coinsurance. Pay attention to the co-pays. Pay attention to the maximum out-of-pocket. And find that balance for your particular budget. Right, because that's uh, basically what you're saying. It's kind of like auto insurance. The higher the deductible, obviously, the lower the premium. So if you're choosing higher coinsurance, higher co-pays, things of that nature, the insurance company is going to reward you with a lower premium. Absolutely. Because so, you're assuming more of the risk. So that's the Absolutely. Reason. So let's go on and talk about the uh, ACA, the Affordable Care Act. 
So this is so beneficial to so many. Um, and it is a subsidy that every one of us has access to. So the, the trick with the ACA subsidy is do you want it to be a monthly subsidy? So what I mean by that in general terms is that if you guys um, don't process the paperwork to do a monthly subsidy, you will still get the subsidy at the end of the year when you file your taxes. On the other hand, I decide that I want to file the paperwork for my subsidy and I get it every month. But at the end of the year, I don't get to take it off of my taxes. So if you decide you want to sign up for a monthly subsidy, you will need to go to your state's exchange. And it varies from state to state. Some states actually loop back and participate in the federal exchange. And you'll know that if you go to your, if you're in the state of Arizona, for example, you, this, the state of Arizona goes to the federal exchange. In the state of Colorado, the state of Colorado has its own individual exchange. Uh, Nevada has its own individual exchange. So it will vary state by state. And you'll have to follow the steps depending upon, here's the magic word again, the state of domicile. Where are you going to have your home state, as it were? Do you happen to know how the ACA um, subsidy is in Florida, since we've mentioned that as a more favorable state for health care insurance? Um, it's, it's, it's on, on par, it's supposed to be equal. It's, uh, the on exchange product is the same as the off exchange product. The problem for us as consumers is that the contracts that physician offices, uh, have may or may not accept, uh, an exchange or an on exchange product. And that has nothing to do with the product we as consumers see. It has everything to do with what the facility has to do in terms of billing. Okay. So you will find that some physicians do not take an on exchange product. But the product itself is the same animal. The hint in there, kind of hidden in the subtext, is that, gee, if I'm on exchange, and I'm on a PPO, I still need to check that my providers in whatever state I'm in are going to accept an on exchange product. Everybody is eligible for subsidy and tax credits, but you'll have to go out and, and fill out the paperwork and see if my income is such and such, will I qualify for this amount of subsidy? Yes, no, or maybe. And what is it? So um, this year I'm working, I'm full-time employed. Let's say next year I pull the plug, we're going out on the road. Um, if I applied for ACA, will it be based on my income from the previous year like a lot of things are? Or will it be based on my current zero income at that point? I am not a tax advisor. Let me throw that out there and save my patootie. But in general terms, yes, it is going to look at your prior year because of your income. So there could be a catch-up period. I believe the system will also, the, the system, the various systems will also ask you what is your anticipated income. Okay. Now here's where people get into trouble. They, they don't estimate accordingly. And in the case of underestimating, they wind up with a tax liability at the year end. When you enrolled in January and you estimated your income here, and then after it turns out by December, you are way up here. When you get into tax season for the year that we're talking about, you're going to have to report that gross income and you'll owe, you'll owe money back, which is not a tragedy and you can afford it. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's kind of, it's kind of like when you, you know, if you're a self-employed person like you and, and myself, right. you pay your quarterlies or what have you, and you think you're going to make X amount of dollars per year. And then when you go and actually do your taxes and Hey, I've made a lot more than I thought your tax liability is obviously a lot higher than what you had anticipated. So it's kind of the same idea. Absolutely. It's just a caution. I want you guys to have as much information as possible so that you make 
a decision and right. not go into something blind. So yeah. a lot of people just go into this with so-and-so said I should do this. And they're just talking amongst friends and nobody's does this professionally or understands looking at all those little details. Well, and another really great resource is going to be your CPA. And even if you don't have an official CPA, even a bookkeeper, you know, somebody, somebody that knows tax, that, that understands what the tax liability is going to be. So let's go to the next slide. And this is my least favorite slide because it's really super busy, but it's got some important comparisons in this conversation about, you know, the ACA subsidy and purchasing a product that's off exchange versus on exchange. So let me put my glasses on here and point out that this maximum out of pocket when you're off exchange is 16,000 over $16,000. However, if you did qualify for your subsidy, look at that maximum out of pocket, $5,200. And I've pulled out the things that I thought were most important for tonight, today's conversation. Again, understand what it is that you feel is important for your health care coverage, what's going on in your, your life, your health life, and understand what it is you think is more important. Is it important for you to have complete access to anybody wherever you go? and you're willing to pay more money for your premium? Or are you really concerned about your budget and you need to look at qualifying for the subsidy? And you might have to be a little bit more concerned with access once you hit the road. Um, we hear these, these products called health share plans. Those are very, very popular right now. Uh, they are not health insurance. Is that what the like Christian um, co-op is? Is that what that is? That's yes, that? yes. Christian Share. There's um, several of them out there. I, I have a great deal of respect for these health share programs. My biggest problem is a novice agent representing a health share program using the language health insurance. Right. And if you choose a health share program. It, it, it's because I've given you the, the tools to make the decision and you right. understand the limitations of the health share, of a health share type plan. And they can be good. I have some anecdotal experience with health share plans and a very good friend developed a very serious illness and uh, a cancer. Uh, I had to go through some significant treatment therapies and and it was a big deal fortunately for them they had cash flow and they were able to pay for the services up front and then submit the receipts and then later on receive reimbursement for it as an example one infusion was ten thousand dollars so again fortunately they were in a position to have cash flow. And when she had an infusion every week for 16 weeks, they were able to pay for the infusion and be submitting these receipts and, and get reimbursement. Um, and, and I have great admiration for, for these types of plans, but understand that it's health sharing. And you can be denied. Another thing with uh, health share plans and also with accident plans and with critical illness plans, you can be denied coverage. You can be, you know, you can have a pre existing condition and denied a, a policy. I know, because I could see some people hitting the road and just saying, well, we'll figure it out. And in fact, I've been on some live chats with other full-time RVers and especially you youngins, <laughs> some of the people with a, a family and they're under 35 and that's the last thing on their mind to worry about, you know, and, and they really feel like it's okay to go ahead and spend $100,000 on an RV and a truck and they're hitting the road and they haven't really thought about the what ifs. So... Right. I think it's just so important that people don't blow that off. You know, you've got to have, know what you're going to do if. 
and ho hopefully have your homework done for that. Right. So this is kind of Susie's view of the world um, having to do with, with health insurance. And remember, health insurance is health insurance. It's not an indemnity plan. It's not an accident plan. It's not health sharing. But you'll notice that I, I, I've suggested here that maybe you marry up a traditional plan with something like critical illness or accident. Let's say you decide that you want to go, um, you know, hello skiing in Alaska. Uh, maybe an accident plan for adventure type stuff might be something to look at. If you know you have critical illness, such as heart disease or cancer, things of this nature in your family history, maybe you want to look at a critical illness plan. And, and these are fairly inexpensive. When I say fairly, maybe $30 a month to add a critical illness plan. They are indemnity plans and they have a maximum payout. So these can be very, very helpful, especially if you're out on the road. And something bad happens and you need to maybe get back to your home state or home base, whatever that looks like. And that's how these accident plans and critical illness plans can basically supplement a traditional major medical plan. And help you get back to your home state, which again, I want to mention for our viewers that you may have chosen that home state because of taxes or whatever, but in some cases, you might have to see yourself taking your RV back there and finding some place to park it and stay there for a while, right? If you're really sick. Yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't hear enough people being concerned about that. Yeah, especially if you don't have a home base. Um, and there's a lot of YouTube uh, channels that we watch that are now saying, hey, we want a home base. It, and the COVID is what kind of prompted that to happen. Right because they weren't able to get camp campsites anywhere. They weren't ill or anything, but they weren't able to get campsites anywhere. Because you know. the RV park's closed. Right, so that brings up, an, a, you know, hey, what, what happens in an emergency? So that's why, you know, some of these YouTube channels are deciding, hey, I need to have a home base should something happen where I can go and have a place to park my RV and or live. just in general, yeah. full-time RVers. I think right. we're, we're seeing an example of that on YouTube, but full-time RVers are finding out, well, wait, my kids all still live in the state I came from. I made my domicile in South Dakota, and now I'm really sick, and my insurance wants me to go back there for treatment, and it's coming up on February, and I didn't plan to stay in my RV in South Dakota. So those are things that our viewers really need to keep in mind, realities that can happen. You really, really do need to look at that state of domicile, and I urge you to look at PPOs with national coverage. Yeah. Uh, emergency coverage for most plans is, is, is already in there. But emergency is, you know, stop the bleeding and then send you home or send you somewhere. Right. And, and that, you, it's really, really important. For you guys that are that are full time RVers, you're finding really really creative ways to to have cash flow and in reinventing yourselves and offering services like you know you and, and Jamie, and that meant or means for for you and Jamie that you're going to give up a traditional job. Take a look at what this new job that you're taking on looks like and investigate whether what you're doing is something that that would mean you are part of a professional organization oh, okay. and i didn't talk about um, ahps it's that third bullet point there but an ahp it's an association health plan and an example might be so for example directors guild of america dga the DGA has a plan. Um, realtor associations. I'm in Colorado in the Denver metro area, and the Denver Metro um, Realtors Association has a professional group plan. So t don't be afraid to look at what you guys are doing and consider maybe joining a professional association. Check and see do they have a health plan and does it answer? a lot of the questions I hope I'm generating for you today. 
And if it does, that could be a really great opportunity to join a group plan as well. AHPs, a professional association, those are options to get what feels like an employer-based plan. So before you hit the road, I had some other thoughts here. Um, call me. I have that up here. Call me. I'm a broker. And if I can't help you because it's a state-specific question and it's not a state that I write insurance in, I'll, I'll look to see if I can help you find a broker. In more states than just Colorado, right? I do. I do in more states. I do. Eras, it doesn't matter. I do a lot. But there's also research on the internet and I've provided some links. Um, healthsherpa.com. I'm in Colorado. Connect for Health. Even though you don't live in Colorado, this is a pretty easy website to navigate. And it could be fun and easy for you to play around there because you don't have to put any personal information. All you need to do is put your birth date and pick a Colorado zip code. And you can start to look at what, what are plans and, and what does health insurance really feel like. So it, it can get you familiar with a lot of the high points that I've touched on today without having to put any skin in the game, uh, which would result in 20 million brokers calling you, which you don't want. And last but not least, health, least healthcare.gov. Really, really detailed information there. Wow. Thank you for all. This is so much information. Yeah, thank you very we, much. Obviously with Jamie, um, <laughs> doing insurance except health insurance, he understood a lot of these terminology before me going into this, but you've been so helpful um, for helping us, like you said, figure out all the questions that we're going to need answers to before we just go for it. As, unless people have the option to do COBRA, which buys them some time, and maybe that that's okay for them. I would still personally want to know what our plan is before we hit the road. Well, yeah, because that way you're not going in and blindly, not knowing what your budget's going to be, because you can get out there and not have a plan and then decide, hey, you know, I need to have health insurance, and I never thought about that. <laughs> Thank you again so much. And I know you put so much time into all this, learning about the RV world and, and us who are – Planning to be full timers, and even those who are out there that are full timers, it definitely is um, a different community, but it's a close knit community. And so, this is really good information for everyone. And uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Open enrollment for those of us under 65 is November 1st through December 15th. Each year, these plans change. Even the plan that you currently have can have major changes going into the next year. So, you'll be sure you want to review that. We've put timestamp links down below in the description, so if you want to refer back to specific parts of the video, you'll be able to do it that way. This wraps up our four-part series on preparing for the RV life. We'll put links in the description below for the other three videos so you won't miss anything. Be sure to subscribe for all the information you need for RV living. And ring the bell so you won't miss out on any of the valuable tips, tricks, and travel ideas each time we upload a new video. See you next time. Bye. Okay, Roamers, let's wrap it up.